let's start with um, the 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 fantasy that sure. uh, we have been sold, and then we'll talk about you know sort of why it's been created. Sure, sure. Uh, the fantasy economy is basically a misleading version of the economy and the education system in the interests of corporations and the wealthy. Um, I trace it to the 1980s primarily. The Reagan administration really plays a significant um, uh, role in the book. But, but over the decades, it's, it's sort of been ramped up. And uh, now, you know, in higher education, uh, it's kind of like the air we breathe. Um, there's sort of two claims, two overarching claims. One is the education system is, is always failing. And two, that the workforce is, is always inadequate. It's never good enough, right? And these two claims are just repeated endlessly by corporations, by foundations, by education reformers. Um, and, you know, to the point where it's pretty much all we hear for a long time, it was really directed at K-12, like, you know, the Reagan folks and nation at risk and all that stuff. But then since the great recession, it's really been, the pressure has been ratcheted up against higher ed. So, you know, if you ask anybody who works in higher ed, I mean, they, they will tell you that this is all we hear that, that we're letting the public down, that, um, the public has lost faith in us. Uh, that our graduates don't have the right skills and and so on and so forth. So that's so, kind of how I see it. Yeah. So to be specific, what we're talking about is when the economy is not working for people mm -hmm. uh, and when um, we have uh, uh, raised unemployment in particular, um, it has been a function of mismatched skill sets and having to uh, retrain or to um, edu make our... our like, is this created to protect the economy or is it created to essentially attack essentially our system of education, largely public education, even if we're talking about higher ed? Um, it, more so the latter, but um, because really it's been the, the foundation of the whole education reform movement. I mean, if you convince pretty much everybody involved, I mean, much of this is targeted at the education establishment, targeted at the media. Um, you know, the notion that, you know, the schools are failing, higher ed is failing. Um, but what I argue in the book that it's, it's much, much bigger than that. Uh, it was really a, a mythical account of the economy, of the labor market that was kind of, um, you know, created uh, in order to impose a very unpopular neoliberal order. I mean, in, if you think about, you know, I mean, I grew up in upstate New York. I'm from Syracuse and, and I lived in Buffalo. I went to grad school in Albany. And, and you know, I, I, I grew up during the 80s when, you know, industry was just going away almost weekly. Right. Um, if you think about what's happening. Right. Industry is, 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 you know, basically going overseas. Unions are under constant assault. And what I argue in the book is that really starting with the Reagan folks, you know, the, the, the policymakers and, and business interests and eventually foundations start to say, well, the real problem here is, is that the education system is failing. That's why industry is leaving. That's why wages are stagnant. That's why unemployment, you know, 30 years ago was eight, nine, 10 percent. Right. That's why you haven't gotten a raise in, in, you know, X number of years. It's not it has nothing to do with business. Right. It has nothing to do with the economy. It has everything to do with education. So I think that's really the the primary motivation because you can't you can't go to you know go to Syracuse where I grew up in 1985 and give a speech and say guess what we're going to ship all your jobs overseas we're going to fight all minimum wage increases we're going to do everything we can to destroy labor unions vote for us <laughs> I mean it's not going to work it's not going to work so what what uh, you know what really the Reagan folks and, and, and the business community kind of march lockstep and they say, well, there's all these jobs that require a high level of skill. And so it's up to the education system to, to really uh, uh, you know shape people's livelihoods. Uh, and, and so since that time, the entire discussion of economic opportunity in the United States, the entire mainstream discussion, has been solely focused on the education system. And that's right up until the present day. So now it's up to us. It's up to higher ed, right, to, to basically, you know, 
give people middle class security and and all the rest of it. And, you know, what I argue in the book throughout is that we can't do that. The education system can't create jobs. It can't give people raises. It can't, you know, it can't do any of those things. Um, We educate and we put students out into the world and and, you know, some do really well. Others don't. Uh, and who gets blamed? We get blamed. Higher ed gets blamed. That's how the politics of the fantasy economy work. Always, always, always put it back on the education system and deflect away from, you know, business and policymakers and institutions and, and any basically anything else. It's always up to the education system. And that's why we're seen as chronically failing, because we've we've been assigned something that we can't do. Right. I mean, I, I there is an analog. I mean, you write, uh, you know, largely about higher ed, but there's an analog with K through 12, too, in the sense that it's supposed to um, K through 12 is supposed to supersede our poverty and social ills. Uh, right. Instead of addressing those directly, it is about the uh, the education you know, the, um, the the elementary schools are failing rather than look at, well, the real problem is uh, before the kids get to the front door, essentially, um, because everything is written in stone. I mean, largely uh, written in stone, maybe a slight exaggeration, but certainly incredibly predictable based upon what the uh, social uh, situation is and economic situation is of those kids. Yeah. And what I discovered uh, during the course of the research is really, you know, in the 70s and and in, into the 80s, there was still kind of a mainstream debate about, um, well, you know, can we, you, you know, you know, can, you know, on one side, you know, was, well, schools can't overcome poverty, right? They can't overcome the hardships of poverty. That was a mainstream position that had a lot of defenders in, in much of, you know, conventional debate. Um, but then the other side was, was, has always been, um, well, no, it's really about the schools. It's about the teachers. And if we just fix the schools and, and, and had higher standards and all the rest of it, then, then, you know, all children can learn and all these sorts of things that, you know, on the surface, you can't, who can object to that, right? Who could, who could, you know, disagree with that? But the, the, the former argument kind of lost, <laughs> lost in political terms, right? That, and the argument that, that the schools could somehow magically overcome poverty, you know, even though it really doesn't square with common sense, I, I think, kind of won in policy circles, right? Um, that, no, we have to hold everybody to high standards, right? Uh, and if we're not trying to educate, you know, the lowest income students to the best of our ability, we're abdicating our responsibility and, and so forth. But the fact is, as you point out, I mean, the schools can overcome poverty and, and the hardship that, that, you know, accompanies it. And, and, you know, kids who, who come from low income households and, and are, you know, uh, food insecure households and, and move quite frequently because that's what happens with lower income students. They move all, oftentimes, uh, you know, new schools, change schools, change teachers and all the rest of it. Uh, but yet schools are somehow magically supposed to uh, overcome all that stuff and then, and then, you know, fix it. And by the time they graduate, these students will be ready to go to college. Um, it, it's really kind of a, a denial of, of the whole, you know, context of what poverty is, I think. And so is this a, I mean, I just, uh, I want just so we can move past the Genesis, it feels like there's a quality uh, to this, uh, like, um, you know, uh, to quote Paul Wolfowitz, you know, when he was talking about the weapons of mass destruction, it was the one thing we could all agree on, uh, yeah. because the, on one hand, it is, um, education is blamed, our, our poor education is blamed to basically cover up for decisions that we make as a society within our economy. We're going to allow companies to leave. We're going to disempower unions. We're going to not raise the minimum wage. We're going to, you know, not tax uh, wealthy people and redistribute the wealth, whatever, all these political decisions we make, um, they, uh, instead of having an awareness that we're making these political decisions, we blame the failure of the economy, not working for everybody on the education. At the same time, there is a very healthy, anti-public education or public school i should say uh movement in this country which is um also joined by both like very religious people um and uh by 
uh, people who just don't, or, you know, I think there's some racist foundation for it. Public education is a function of of reconstruction and is a way to address um, sort of inequalities that came about uh, via slavery in many respects. Um, there's that assault. So it's almost like education is being attacked from both sides. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. There's different, you know, kind of wings here to the education reform movement. They're, they're kind of the libertarian interests that, that, you know, you're talking about that are very hostile to the whole concept of public education. And they've pushed, you know, school vouchers for decades and, and austerity and higher ed, you know, is, is sort of a, a priority. Um, but then there's sort of, you know, what I would call neoliberal foundations that are, are less opposed necessarily to, to at least ostensibly to, to public education, but are always criticizing it. Uh, they and and basically, you know, trying to reform it. Um, you know, charter schools are seen as kind of a solution, uh, according to you know a lot of folks in that camp. But at the end of the day, they they, they share a very common set of of policy goals and interests: hostility to organized labor, um, and, and basically just a, a support of what we would call sort of the neoliberal consensus. Um, and and basically a, a desire to kind of put the whole thing on the schools. So there are important differences. You're right. I mean, and, and there's a lot of, of very hostile forces that are that are kind of going after public education, for sure. Uh, let's talk about some of those um, uh, that I guess that latter group like the and this was uh, really sort of came out of the. Um, the aughts, if I remember correctly, where, you know, George Bush had no uh, child left behind. Um, yeah. And uh, this notion of, you know, the soft bigotry of low expectations yeah. uh, that existed and the corporate reform movement. And then we ultimately saw that with like, uh, you know, so it's the Gates Foundation and then Arne Duncan uh, under the Obama administration, sort of carrying this corporate reform uh, movement uh, forward, all of which it seems to me, and this, I mean, I, and I guess I don't, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but in some respects, we, it feels like we are in a post corporate education reform movement, uh, era and arguably a, maybe a little bit early soon to say this, but a post neoliberal, at least, you know, in terms of like, you know, um, it, it is not as dominant of an idea uh that it used to be let's say five years ago would you agree with would take both those because they're separate things but uh but maybe they're they go hand in hand so are you are you suggesting like with the latter point post neoliberal you mean the 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 big picture basically you're talking yes about. i'm saying like yeah. in terms of an era i mean certainly the corporate reform movement seems to i mean education reform k through 12 seems to have died um and we're in sort of a post uh, era of that i mean you know and i uh, maybe i peg that to like the rand corporation saying that the gates foundation experiment was a disaster etc cetera, etc cetera. but um i would also just I'll maybe add another wrinkle too which is this new focus on trade schools potentially being a part of that new i don't know if that's what you were alluding to sam at all but well not but necessarily trade era. schools but just broadly speaking i mean i think okay. like education is sort of like a, we uh, Things like standardized tests and, and, and whatnot. Are we past that era? And and let's maybe it's a good opportunity to talk about those as well. I mean, I think there's a couple things to to think about. Uh, you know, I'm reminded, uh, and I know you had John Shelton on the show, his book, The Education Myth. John and I talk about, you know, are, are we on the verge of sort of a paradigm change here um, beyond neoliberalism? I mean, it's it's the the consensus is at least being questioned a, a bit more. I mean, unions are polling very high am among the public. And, and I think people realize, Hey, the last 40 years haven't gone very well for a lot of people. Right. I think that, that, are, I mean, there's all sorts of books, nonfiction authors and journalists have written these great books uh, in the last five to 10 years about, about, you know, the last 40 years and sort of reinterpreting a lot of it beginning with the Reagan administration. <laughs> um, so I think that that, I think that they're the beginnings of, of that, uh, right now uh, are, are kind of happening. Where it goes from here, I'm not quite quite sure. But, um, you know, the the emphasis, I, you know, I think uh, Emma mentioned, you know, trade schools. I mean, there's some, some you know, segments of, of corporate America that are kind of uh, 
um, uh, pushing that concept quite a bit. Um, they seem a little bit at odds with the, the mainstream view among reformers, and that is everybody has to get a college degree. Um, that's still really, you know, post high school education. This is what I talk about in the book throughout. Um, that is still the, the, the larger goal of m most, not all, but most education reforms is, is no, no, that in order to, to move ahead, you really have to go, you know, to, to, to school beyond high school and get, get a degree or whatever. That's why I brought up trade schools, right? Which is, is perhaps we're in this era of, um, you know, when you're the, the myth of education essentially solving for poverty and all these societal ills that the government needs to be involved in. Um, there's this kind of renewed focus on education as a funnel into economic usefulness under capitalism and somebody that can be a, a, a pliant worker or somebody that's going to provide value as opposed to the more holistic enriching elements of that. And I feel like even though trade schools obviously are a good thing, that kind of new like let's move towards uh, this being the, the goal of higher education is a bit of an extension of, you know, that kind of myth that you describe. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, higher ed is, is, you know, as we speak all around the country, you know, being turned more and more into, you know, uh, well, we have to adopt more STEM programs, even though there's very few STEM jobs. Um, and that's not top secret. I mean, it's not like I'm the first person to write about that. This is not like confidential information, the nature of the labor market. And this is why I wrote the book. I started looking up all this official labor market data. And I'm like, wait a minute now. Uh, the, the economy is dominated by low education, low skill, uh, low wage jobs. And, and we can't change that. The education system can't change that. No matter how many people we crank out, uh, we can't change that. And yet we're blamed for people's economic problems. Um, but yeah, I mean, around the country right now, I mean, I work in the Uni University of Wisconsin system. There, there are many states that have state surpluses, right? Uh, West Virginia University got a lot of attention recently in the national press. Uh, West Virginia is a state with a state surplus, and and what's happening? They're they're basically gutting the flagship university there. Um, not even you know, there's not even a, a a possibility of using a state surplus to sort of shore up, you know, as Emma was talking about, sort of you know broad based education uh, because it's been it's been narrowed to the point where you know pretty much the the whole discussion is basically. Uh, you go to college to get a job, end of story. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, higher ed doesn't do, do, you know, we're a huge part of the problem. And one of the things I keep talking about is higher ed has to talk about higher ed differently. We have to talk about the purposes of education differently. Um, because basically what higher ed does for the most part, almost entirely is just echo the language of workforce development and all this kind of stuff. And that just feeds into this larger narrative that that well, um, you know, the the education system is responsible for your livelihood, so we have to fix the education system, not the larger economy.